I need to tell you that now that I've turned our church over four years ago, I've had the opportunity to travel quite a bit, and it seems like you get a better pulse for where the church is worldwide when you're traveling, and uh, I've seen a lot of significant things begin to take place, but one of the things that I've seen recently is that there is on the horizon a major shift uh, in the body of Christ. That, that we were kind of in between seasons for the last several years. And by the way, that's not bad. It's very natural, right? Because how many know when you get in between seasons, the weather can go either way, right? So like when we get in September, it starts to cool down. October, it starts to cool down. And we're shifting into the winter season and we're in between. So it can be 70 one day and then it can be 50 the next day. And, and that's a little confusing because you're... you're putting your summer clothes up and you're getting your winter clothes out, but, but you're in between and you don't know from day to day. Well, the church has been in between seasons, and that's not bad because it's always victorious in any process, amen, because it's the church of Jesus Christ. But we've been a little in between seasons, and, um, and we're about to shift. And when the church shifts, that means the body of Christ shifts. So I came this morning to tell you there's a shift about to take place, amen? And it involves your life. It involves who you are and more importantly, who you're becoming. And so as a result of that, I think we're going to see some incredible things take place. I wouldn't doubt by the end of this year that there will be no pews that aren't full in this place, amen? There's a shift taking place. You're in a good season, God's doing some good things, but some great things are on the horizon, and I just, I'm not Bishop Jakes, but I tell, I'm coming to tell you, get ready, get ready, get ready, amen? I ain't going to try to say it like he does, but I'm just telling you, get ready, great things are about to happen. Uh, This week as I was preparing, I came across some material that was from a long time ago, but a, a man that wrote on, on the kinds of people that are in the earth today. And he, he was more of a, a, just a speaker, but his name was Stephen Scott. And he said this, and I think I have the slide there. He said, there are four kinds of people, four kinds of people. The first kind of person is a, called a drifter, a drifter. And 50% of the population, and this was over several million people, he said are, are drifters. And they're basically people who go with the flow of life, allowing life to throw at them whatever it chooses. It's kind of that old, and you have to be really old to know this person, but Doris Day used to sing the song, K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. I mean, no, you can't find that in the Bible. Amen. But, but drifters kind of live that life. They just... Flow with whatever's happening. Amen. And then the second group of people were called pursuers. And that was 25% of the population that was surveyed. Basically, pursuers are basic people who pursue a dream until they meet an obstacle and then back off. So they, they do really well and then they meet an obstacle and they back off. How many know in Christ we can't do that? Amen. How many, how many have met an obstacle already this year? Amen. But the fact that you're here means you didn't back off. Amen. The third group of people are called achievers. That's 24.99% of people that were interviewed. These are people that have lofty goals, achieve some of their dreams, but rarely achieve significant dreams. They're called achievers. That means you have some goals, but even though you're not doing all the things you plan to do, you achieve some of them, but not some of the significant things, and they seem to be lost somewhere or set on a shelf somewhere. And then the fourth group of people are called super achievers, and that's 0.01% of the people that were surveyed in this survey. Those are people who have acquired their master strategies and skills to be successful virtually in every venue of their lives. They do the extraordinary. They they do the extraordinary. They are not limited by anybody, anything, anywhere. 
They, they say, either get with me or get out of my way because I'm moving forward. I'm not limited by my past. I'm not limited by my present. I'm not limited by my thoughts. I'm not limited by my experiences. I am a super achiever and I will not back up, sit down, or go away. I'm moving forward. Amen. How I many know that sounds like a Bible believing, tongue talking, Holy Ghost filled believer in God? Can I get an amen? But when you're not in that place, you can experience what is called the law of frustration. That says, I'm not doing what I need to do or be or doing or I'm not becoming what I'm supposed to be. That is called frustration. I'm not doing what I need to be doing and not, not becoming who I'm supposed to be. Can I share with you this morning that I'm here to bring a word because I believe there is a shift in the body of Christ. Things are happening and about to explode at a level that most of us in our lifetimes have not seen. And things are about to take place, but people have to be ready for what God's about to do. Because if you get caught in a routine, the routine will always keep you back and sit you down. In other words, I come to church because I'm supposed to come to church and we sing some songs and then I hear a word and then I go home about my normal business. Life is not que sera, sera. There are hills and valleys in life, but there's victory to victory to victory to victory. We are more than conquerors. We are conquerors, but we're more than conquerors because we live at a different level. We think at a different level. And so I want to challenge all of us this morning that we go through struggles. But as we go through struggles, it leads us to triumph. So this morning I want to use as a subject from struggles to triumph. The Bible says in John, the Gospel of John, he said, In this world, you will have troubles. He he didn't say you might have troubles. He didn't say they will come from time to time. He said, in this world, you're going to have some troubles. Anybody ever had some troubles? Anybody had some troubles this year? Anybody had, had a few troubles this month? Anybody had some troubles this morning? Yeah, she said, this morning. Amen. They're going to come in this life. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. In other words, look up and be happy that what you're going through is not going to take you out, but it's going to take you in. What the enemy planned to to isolate you and take you down did not succeed by the mere virtue that you're here this morning. You didn't quit. You didn't give up. But I'm here to say, let's go to the next level. Let's go to the next thing that God's about to do. Let's shift in our thinking, in our behavior towards our future. So I think this morning we're going to read a familiar passage of Scripture, but there's interesting, there's only three Scriptures in the Bible concerning this particular man. And I know all of you have heard this story, but this morning I'm going to take you to truths that you have never heard in relation to to this man learning not how to be taken out, but how to be taken in. Are you with me this morning? Morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And I'm going to read two verses. This is two of the three verses that might mention his name. In verse number 9 it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Jabez lived at a level that his brothers were not living. Jabez thought in, in, in realms that his brothers never thought of living. He was honorable. He was set aside. He lived something that, that he talked about. Amen. I mean, you know, there's a lot of Christians that talk about stuff but don't live, about, live that stuff. Amen. It's time to live it, right? And so the Bible says that he was honorable. He was set aside. And his mother had named him Jabez, saying... I gave birth to him in pain. I gave birth to him in pain. So his mother decided to name him out of that moment of experience. 
because Jabez actually means pain. So she put on her son her experience. Her experience was pain, and so she just called him pain. Are you with me this morning? She just called him pain. So his name literally in Hebrew means pain. Could you imagine if you were having a a baseball game and you were choosing sides? How many know that he would be last to be chosen? Well, I'll take victorious and I'll take strong leader and I'll take this. And then the last person said, well, I guess I'll take pain. (laughs) That's all that's left, you know. Come on, Jabez, I got to take you. There's nobody else left. You can be on my team. Sit over there. Because I ain't going to put pain up first. Certainly he's not called cleanup, so I ain't going to put him forth. Amen. You pain. You just sit over there. Relax. All his life, he had to hear his name called pain. Called pain. His birth, that's where he came from. Everybody in this room has come from somewhere different. Your background, your family, your brothers, sisters, your mothers, fathers, or the lack thereof, is a part of your past, a part of your experience, a part of your growing up. Somehow, if we're not careful... What we go through tries to define us. It tries to put on us things that God never intended to be put on you. You go through stuff. Amen. That's a deep word, right? You go through stuff. Say stuff. Stuff. Anybody had some stuff in your life? Amen. You wish it wouldn't have happened. You try to explain it away, but it's still there. And I found that the more you give the past a voice, the more it controls your present. So Jabez spent his life, everybody calling him pain. Everywhere he went, he was called called pain. And yet he was from the tribe of Judah. He caused pain, sorrow, but he was defined by that, but his descendants were of Judah. Now that's confusing. When your descendants are praised and your name is pain, that's a problem because they don't usually exist together. And so here's Jabez from the tribe of praise or Judah causing pain. What happens when you present praise but have pain? One or the other will prevail. If you let pain talk too much, if you let pain rehearse in your mind things you went through, oftentimes that you should not have gone through. If the pictures of some of those experiences are painted so deeply that in a moment's time you see something and it reminds you of that, and that video almost runs in your mind in four-color HD to the extent that it paralyzes you, pain has again taken its toll on your life. The results is that pain begins to lock you in. And even though you wear a smile, there's a frown behind it that is more real than the smile on the outside. Because pain runs deep down on the inside. You become afraid to try because people say everything you try caused pain and You're afraid to try anymore. You're afraid of relationships because the relationships you were in caused you pain or you caused pain in them. And now 
relationships just remind you of pain. You're afraid for new opportunities because every opportunity in your past hasn't panned out the way you thought it would, the way you thought it could. It never really happened and now you're afraid to even take new opportunities because you're locked in to pain. You're afraid to venture out because you're locked in. So things that God would have you to do, you always dream about, but you never seem to really do them. At times you might even talk about them, but you don't even want to talk about them too much more because you're afraid they're not going to happen. So you're afraid to venture out, so you just exist. And even though you read the scriptures, you may even come to church and you may sing the songs like we sang this morning. But somehow in the midst of it, pain tries to keep ringing its voice in your subconscious. You're afraid of failure because you failed too many times. And even though we come to church and we talk about victory and breakthrough and everything else, you're afraid that Failure will once again visit your house and keep you back. I'm not talking about an isolated few people in the body of Christ. I'm talking about a lot of people in the body of Christ that don't want to talk about it. Certainly don't rehearse it out in the open, but somehow in the back of their minds, in the deep recesses of their life, they're still held back from going to the next level. I know you love God and I know you're here in church and I I know you read your Bible, but somehow, deep down on the inside, there's a resistance that's keeping you from making the kind of progress you're supposed to make. You're afraid of disappointment. You know where disappointment, dis means without. Without an appointed place. I'm just disappointed. I've had some disappointments in life. I thought I'd be in a different place. I thought I'm going to break out of the neighborhood and I'm going to get an education, but I never had the money to go to college. I thought by now I'd have my own house and driving the car. I always dreamed of driving and I seemed to be disappointed by it. I thought I'd have that right relationship and it never happened. I'm disappointed. I don't talk about it because because people in church would tell me, well, just lift up your eyes, look to the hills when it cometh your help. And they have all these scriptures and I know them and I can quote them, but somehow in the midst of it, I have some disappointments. So just... Leave me alone in my pain, which is called the definition of isolation. We live in a society where you almost can live your whole life on the Internet. You can talk to people, express yourself. They can't look you eye to eye. You can just say what you want, when you want, how you want. We we live in this world of isolation that we call social media. Isolation, just a different form of it. And we never seem to really dig deep and deal with life. His birth. His birth told him everything he would never do. Nobody wanted that for him. Certainly his mother didn't, but she just out of the moment of pain called him pain. And now he lives with it every day of his life. His past, his birth, his background. Life has a way of throwing us things we don't anticipate. But I appreciate those that wouldn't let their past totally keep them from moving forward. There has to be a moment, a mark, where God comes to change that. And if he can't change that, he can't change your future. If God cannot change your past, he cannot change your future. 
But I came this morning to tell we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows about your past, and you cannot let your past define you. You have to let it refine you. In other words, you can look at your past and say, you thought you were going to take me out. But I'm here today to tell you, you did not take me out. In fact, I'm going to learn from you at such a degree that I'll help people who are, who are where I was and help them to get out. So you thought you were going to kill me. You just trained me for my future. He has some barriers. We all deal with some of those barriers. Barriers are things that try to build around you. Because when you don't deal with the pain of your past, there's barriers of the present. They build around you. Those barriers usually take on form. It could be men or women or weight or insecurity, or drugs, or failure. Here's the big one, or rejection. They become barriers. They become barriers. They build themselves around you to the extent that you want love, but you find it in the wrong place. You want that man to love you, and he told you he loved you, but all he wanted was sex. Because when he got what he wanted, he said goodbye for the next. So barriers, insecurities, things that we are just becoming so insecure that he locks you in and your personality God gave you and we need you. But if you're locked in your insecurities, you'll never venture out. We never get to experience the fullness of what you have to offer us in the body of Christ. Drugs make you forget that pain for a moment. And then they wear off. Failures, if you let them, again, define you. But if you learn from them, they refine you. Every person who ever became anything failed many times before they became a success. But they didn't quit upon their, their non-successes. They learned from them to become successful. In other words, you can have your place in my life, but you cannot own me. Because I will never be a failure. I may fail, but I'll never be a failure. You cannot name me failure. You cannot dominate in my life. You cannot control my mind or my emotions. You have no power to do that. You existed. I'm going to learn from you. And next time I face you, I'm going to be a different person. You tried to take me out, but I'll recognize you when you're far off. And I'll tell you where you can go. Oh, yeah, you can tell them. You can tell them exactly where they need to go. Come on. I wish I had somebody be real in here. There was another man in Scripture called Benoni. He was the son of Rachel. He... His father was Jacob. Rachel was giving birth. And in the midst of birth, she started experiencing death. And in the moment of her passing, she said, I will call him Benoni, son of sorrow. But thank God he had a daddy, Amen. a father, who said, my son, will not be called son of sorrow. So he changed his name before he heard his old name and said he'll be called Benjamin. He won't be son of sorrow. He'll be the son of my right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benjamin, son of my right hand. 
He's going to be the strength that walks with me and I'll train and he'll become powerful and he'll be anointed and, and he, he'll, he'll conquer rather than be conquered. You see, there's got to be a moment if there's nobody to help change your name, there's got to be a spiritual father like Pastor Lawrence Peoples. He'll say, daughter, that ain't going to define your future. Son, that's not going to define your f- future. You've been through some tough times and he'd stand today and say, and I have too. And the street thought they would destroy me, but the fact that I'm here, it didn't. The jail thought it would lock me in, but all it did is lock me into God and I came out a different person. You can't let your past define you with his barriers. So he said, I'm going to have to start associating some of my pain with some praise. And then our text says this very interesting thing. It says in verse 10, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. I love that. Some translations say pray. And I love prayer, and prayer is vital to our lives, and everything that's not birthed in prayer, maintained in prayer, and perpetuated in prayer ain't going to happen. We all know that, or at least we should know that. But this word is interesting that when it says, I cried out to the Lord. It doesn't mean I will religiously say, O Lord, thou knowest my problems I facest in this hourest, and therefore I come to thee. This was not the time to do that. The Bible says he cried out to God. In other words, he was through with all that stuff. He was through with everything they said. He was through with everything he experienced. He learned what he needed to learn, And he had a moment where he said, from this day, from this moment, from this time in my life, I'm going to experience God who's going to change everything in my life to take me into my future. There's got to be a moment that you're fed up with all the stuff. There's got to be a moment when you said, it's true. Today I make my stand and I will no longer depend on that because some people, some people, some people try to get value from where they've been. And so they rehearse it in a sad way to get attention that only defines you more according to your past. But there's got to be a moment in your life where you say, I'm shifting. I'm, I, 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 I'm going to a different place from this day forward. I, 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 I've learned what I need to learn. And I've gone through what all I need to go through. And I'm ready to make a difference in somebody else's life. And so, therefore, I'm cutting ties. I'm breaking strongholds. I'm resisting the enemy for everything he attempted to do. I'm calling him out. I'm going to clearly address this because when I turn my back on it, I ain't going to ever look back. This day, this day. Come on, say this day. day. So he cried out. Jesus! Oh God, I've had a pitiful past and I I made so many mistakes. You're just rehearsing it in your pain. You got to cry out. But when you cry out, you got to cry out to him. You don't cry out in your pain because you've done that. We've all done that. Why, God, why did I have to go through that? God, why why didn't you do that? We've done that. But there's got to be a moment when you cry to him. When you're saying, God, Jesus, 
I need a visitation so that you become a habitation that you help me to learn out of my future, my past and give me a future. So I'm not asking you to come. I'm asking you to stay deep down on the inside of my life until I'll never look back again. I'll never look back again. Come on, say he prayed. Say he cried out. It's time to cry out. Come on, say Jesus. There's a cry in this place. Let me help you. 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 Where the church is heading is going to take a desperate people. We, we cannot afford to attend church. We have to be a desperate people. We have to be a desperate people. Because God will not use just, quote, an elite chosen. You have all the, and I'm for education, but you have all the degrees. You, that some people just make them a thermometer because they have all the degrees. Uh, but I'm for education. I'm not against education. But education comes in a lot of different ways. And sometimes the University of Hard Knocks is the best university you could ever go to. And I know people that have doctorates from the University of Hard Knocks. They have doctorates, plural doctorates. But they wise, filled with wisdom because they learned, they grew, they learned. So he cried out, he prayed, he cried out to the God of Israel, to Jehovah God. And this is what he said. Let's just look at this. I don't know how far we're going to get this morning. I forgot what time I was supposed to be done. I'll let you out by dinner. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. kidding. He cried out, and this is the first thing he said. Oh, that thou would have blessed me indeed. Why? Because at that point, he needed God's blessing. When we say the word blessing, we think of praying over our food. Oh, Lord, bless his food in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. No, that wasn't what he was praying for. Mm -mm. Wasn't a cute little blessing. This was a life-changing moment. He was crying out for God to pronounce a blessing on his life that would so transform him that he said, I'm just not going to ask you to bless me. I'm going to ask you to bless me indeed. Oh, I wish you could hear this. I, 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 I don't need just another blessing. Bless you, daughter. Bless you, son. No, I need an indeed blessing. I need a crazy blessing. I need a wild blessing. I need an enormous, extravagant blessing. I need something to so come on me that my back will be sealed from my past once and for all. That the only time my past will be talked about is when I talk about it as a testimony of what the Lord has done. See, a lot of people don't have a testimony because they ain't been through a test. But when you've been through a test, you got a testimony. I need an indeed blessing. It reminds me of the story in Genesis 32 of Jacob. Jacob been through some stuff. His whole life was a struggle. Jacob was a mess. He was a manipulator, a liar, cheater. He, he, his life was a mess. And then he met his father-in-law, and that was a mess. He reaped what he sowed. 
Thought he was getting one thing, got another. Cost him seven years. <laughs> and then he said, how do I get out of here? And so he runs out of there with his wives. Amen. How many know that's a problem right there? Amen. I just leave that alone. So he, he, he runs out of there and he gets word that his brother Esau was waiting for him. How many know he really messed up? He stole his birthright. His father's, that, that's a whole different subject. But I mean, he messed up. Esau was not happy. In fact, the scripture said he was going to kill him. And he was capable of it. And so Jacob starts saying, oh, what will I, what will I do? So he sends all his possessions and all his family ahead of him. He said, maybe that will soften his heart. He'll see, you know, he, my children and my wife and I'm sending him a big offering, everything I've got. And so he finds himself all by himself. Come on, say all by himself. All by himself. How many know there's a good time to get all by yourself? Yes. Mama can't help you. Daddy can't help you. Uncle ain't going to help you. Amen, you're all by yourself. See, he thought he was preparing the way, but God was preparing him. Because he's all by himself. And the Bible says the appearance of what seemed to be an angel, a representative of God, came. And they started to wrestle. Now let me help you theologically, because there's a lot of books written on this and so on, but let me help you. Nobody can wrestle with God and do anything. We're talking about the God of the universe. He's omnipotent. You know what that means? That means you can go to the gym 28 days in a row and ain't going to even bother God. He's going to say, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you a flea. <laughs> so so he, you can't really wrestle with God. So what was Jacob wrestling? He's wrestling with his old nature. Ah, that's it, yeah. But God was helping yeah. him wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> in the midst of it, he's saying, I got to wrestle my, my old nature down. If I don't wrestle my nature down, I can never become what God wants me to be. It has a way of raising its ugly head, so much so that I'm starting to reap all the things I sowed, and I want to seal that thing. So he wrestles all night long. In the midst of it, the angel touches his, his, his hip, and he starts walking with the limp. Why is that? Because somehow God got, had to give you a reminder that no matter where you go, I'm going to remind you that you had victory over your old nature. Whatever, whatever that may be, Paul had a thorn in the breast. We don't even know what that is, but, but he had it because he was so intelligent that he thought he knew everything and all of that and so powerful and orator and stuff that he, he needed something to keep him in check. So whatever God would choose begins to happen. And out of the end of it, God gives him a new name. Israel. No longer will you become liar, manipulator, trickster. But you'll become one who struggled with God and in his struggle destroyed his past. Silence the voice of his past forever. We need a sure enough blessing from heaven. Because I'm telling you where we're going is going to take more than what we know. More than what we've experienced. More than our organizational skills. It's going to take almighty God. And we have to have an indeed blessing, an extravagant blessing that comes on our lives. Pronounce me a blessing, a remarkable, incredible, ridiculous blessing, an abundant blessing, an indeed blessing. And then he prays the second thing. I'm almost done. He said, enlarge my territory. Now, in the natural, that just seems like give me some land, right? 
But territory could be influence. See? You thought it was a plot of land. You thought maybe it was a house. Enlarge my ability to do what I'm called to do. I've been locked into this little box for so long that every time I got out, I hit something that is of my past trying to tell me why I can't, why I'm not good enough, why I don't measure up, why they're going to choose somebody else. Amen. What God's about to do is crazy ridiculous. If, if I can get you to grasp just that thing, it'll take you to a whole nother level. He's not looking at you based on your past. He will look at you based on what you've learned for your past to start ordering your steps for your future. He's not looking at how much money you have or don't have, what car you drive, the house you live in. None of that impresses God. We're going to walk at the stuff that we value so much we'll wear around our necks. That's the roads in heaven. He's not impressed with all that. What he wants is a sold out child that's saying, come on, Jesus. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, he can pick you up from a great place, 3434. Amen. Which was such an awesome experience and such a great relationship. And thank God for Pastor Jeff and Lori for, for, for extending and embracing this church. And, and it just seemed like you should just be there forever. It just was perfect. And God said, no, I'm going to drop you in the middle of Second and Sheridan. A place that looks a whole lot like 61st and Peoria. A place that's so overridden and so, so crazy at moments that a building that should have cost you four times the amount you bought it for, that he reduced it all the way down and made it a... F- oh, I wish somebody... I, I just had something. But he cares because he said, I need some people that are crazy enough to believe that you can transform this area of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And let me help you. There ain't many people willing to do it, I'm telling you. Now, I thank God, and you have a great relationship with the churches in here, but they realized they couldn't do it. That their people were driving from East Tulsa and stuff, and they didn't want to come here. God says, okay, I got a different place for you. But I have a chosen people for this area. I got a special people. I got a special people. I got I got an extraordinary group of men and women that are just crazy enough to believe that I can step in to second and share it and my light will overcome the darkness. So enlarge my territory, God. It means border or landmark or limits. Limits. Because you came from a place that limited you. Your family limited you. Your education tried to limit you. Your financial arrangements tried to limit you. Your your teachers tried to limit you. Your aunts and uncles tried to limit you. And you had so many limits that when God set you free spiritually, it was a deliverance. It was a deliverance. But this next freedom is going to take the limits off. It's going to take the limits off. Things are going to happen. Come on, I wish I just had a crazy people that would say this, because I got to put it in right terms. I'm busting loose. We just got to say it the way we got to say it. Come on, say, I'm busting loose. Come on, look at your neighbor. I don't know about you, 
but I'm busting loose. Come on, brother, come on, tell him. Sister, look at somebody and say, I'm busting loose. I'm gonna break everything that's holding me back. I'm busting loose. Because some things tried to attach themselves in the process. You know, when, when they came out of Egypt, children of Israel, they were there so long that when they came out, they were out of bondage, but bondage wasn't out of them. See, that's why God always puts gaps in your life. A gap is a place between one place and another. So the wilderness was this gap. And they, they had to get some stuff done in the gap to get ready for the promise. So he says, it's just going to be a short journey. But you got to let go because you're out of Egypt, but Egypt ain't out of you. You're still bound in your thinking. You're still limited in your thinking. You still look at people and say, I wish I had what they had. You don't know what they have. Yeah, but they million. Look at that car they drive. Yeah, but they so in debt, they jumping off buildings. They suicidal. They crazy. Amen. They're hurting people everywhere. They're going to reap what they sow. I, not everybody, but I mean, I mean they, sometimes you think you know what they have. You don't know what they have. They on their fifth marriage now, five, 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 fifth marriage now, and they ain't happy. They got money, they got the house, they got cars, they got memberships and uh, everywhere. I mean, they, but they ain't happy. If I had to have all that or happiness, amen, I ain't going to even stop to pray about it. But can I have that with happiness? We'll talk about that later. All right, so we'll talk about that later. But we're talking about taking the limits off. Because God, the only favorites God has are his people. But his love is for everybody. But when you step into him, you're favorite. Amen. And so among God's favorite, there are no favorites. God doesn't love another child of God any more than he loves you. Everything that God is, he offers all his children. We have three adopted children, and one my mother, my wife calls uh, home, homemade. <laughs> but they're all our children. Yeah. And in my will, amen, it's 25, 25, 25, 25. I, it's, it's just, that I love all my children. Amen. amen. God loves all his children. So you're his favorite. Let me, let me help you again. I said, you're God's favorite. You're God's favorite. Come on, look at your name say, you're God's favorite. See, that's the first time some people in this room have ever heard that statement. Come on, tell them, you're God's favorite. Now look at the other side. Say, you're God's favorite. Look them in the eyes. Tell them, you are God's favorite. Favorite. Did you hear me? You are God's favorite. You're God's favorite. Take the limits off. Quit describing why you have limits. We've heard that 20 times. Take the limits off. You serve the God of the universe. You don't serve the God of... Blacks or whites or yellow or red or pink or orange. You're God's favorite. You're a part of the family of God. And you're God's favorite. 